Well, praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Hallelujah. 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 Somebody said, hallelujah, anyhow. Hallelujah, anyhow. Hallelujah, anyhow. Hallelujah, anyhow. Hallelujah, anyhow. Can somebody just wave their hand and say, God, I thank you. Somebody just wave their hand and say, God, I thank you. I thank you, I thank you, I thank you. You didn't have to do it, but you did. You didn't have to keep me, but you did. You didn't have to watch over me, but you did. You didn't have to provide for me, but you did. I got it, but I messed myself up. You still made the way. He is an awesome God, and I in no way, shape, or form count myself worthy to be a member of his family, let alone have the opportunity to share the word in Jesus' mighty name it in way, shape, form, worthy of all that he has done for me. Mm. Hey, glory. Hallelujah. Somebody says, you don't know like I know what God has done for me. You don't know like I know what God has done for me. You don't know like I know what God has done for me. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Thank you. Thank you. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. None like him. None like him. None like him. Hey. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. I don't know about you, but I love him today. I love him. 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 Hallelujah. I love him, I love him, I love him. Ah, yeah, 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 I love him. Hallelujah, excuse me. I love him, I love him. He has just been so good, so good, so good, so good. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Ha, ha, hey, hey, hey. Glory. When you think of the goodness of Jesus, and all he's done for you. My soul cries out, hallelujah. I thank God for saving me. I thank God, I thank God. I don't know about you, but I am so glad to be saved. I am so glad, so glad, so glad, so glad, so glad. I'm so glad, I'm so glad, I'm so glad. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm so glad, I'm so glad. So glad to be on this side of salvation. So glad I ain't lost no more. Woo! Hallelujah. So glad, so glad, so glad. Hallelujah. Y'all don't know the y'all don't know the ex Brian. He was a mess. You hear me? You hear me? He was a mess. But thought he wasn't a mess. You ever been there? <laughs> thought you had it all together? Then you look back and be like, good gosh almighty, I was a mess. I was a mess. But God in his infinite grace and mercy. In his infinite grace and mercy. Anybody know about his grace and mercy? Hallelujah. Your grace and mercy. Ah. Your grace and your mercy. Your grace. Ah, yeah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Your grace and your mercy. Ah. You're so good, Lord. You're so good. Hallelujah, Jesus. Your 
grace and your mercy. Thank you, Lord. for me. He's an awesome God. That brother is so in tune with the spirit, amen. Them brothers are so in tune with the spirit. Thank you. He knows. He knows. Amen. I love flowing in worship with Jimmy and the team. I tell you, I do. I do. I do. I do. I do. And I thank God for them. I thank God for them. none like you, Jesus. Never has been and never will be. You are great, oh God. And your mercies endure forever. Your righteousness outshines the sun. Your beauty is overwhelming, oh God. Your power is without question. Your authority can no one challenge. You are a sovereign God. You do what you will, how you will, when you want to, how you want to. You reign in heaven and in earth and there is no name above the name of Jesus. We just honor you today, Lord, and just count it a privilege that you would even want to sup with us. Who are we that you would even want to be in our presence? How great is our God? How great is our God? We love and adore you, Lord. And we're just so grateful that you love us. Ha. None like you, Jesus. Have your way in our lives. Have your way in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. And somebody said amen. 
Somebody said amen. Somebody said amen. Hallelujah. We count it an honor to be before you today, and we give all the glory and honor and praise to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Without him, we are nothing, but through him, we can do all things. Amen. Through him, we can do all things. So glad to see all of you here this morning who have come out for this Christmas, uh, Sunday before Christmas. Amen, amen, Sunday before Christmas. Good to see you all. But you know what, I, I, gotta, I gotta give a, a special shout out. Can I give a special shout out? Is that all right with y'all? I wanna give a special shout out to Deacon Cahoon. Deacon Cahoon, can you stand up for a moment, Deacon? Amen. Deacon, how old are you, if you don't mind sharing? 80. Somebody give God a hand, praise. Now, Deacon Cahoon, before we found out, I guess about a week ago, before we found out, Deacon Cahoon was taking two buses from Chester to be here. Two buses from Chester to be here at 10 a.m. So you know what time did he have to get up about. Amen? Somebody give, somebody give God a praise. Hallelujah. Thank you so much, Deacon. God bless you, brother. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. And I thank Sister Betty. She has now taken on the mantle of making sure he gets here. Somebody give a hand praise for her. I knew when I called her, I knew what the answer was going to be because that's just the kind of heart she got. That's my sister. That's just the kind. Of, I, I knew it. I knew it. I knew it already. I knew it already. All righty. Well, you know what? If you came to hear about Jesus being born, you should have came last week. <laughs> Go tell it on the mountain. Amen. Somebody give God a hand praise for our elder. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Amen. So if you came to hear about Jesus being born in a manger, go on YouTube. And I thank God about it. I, I truly do because, you know, I was, I was somewhat concerned in my spirit when I felt the word that was rumbling within me. And I was like, that's, that's not a classic Christmas message. You know, and, and I know how it is. Tradition says, you know, we got to talk about Christmas. But today we're not going to talk about Christmas in that sense. Is that all right? Is that all right? Amen. But, you know, I do believe I got a word from the Lord, and I pray that it blesses and inspires and maybe even challenges some of us in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Giving honor to our pastors. Amen. Pastor J, Pastor C. Pastor C is getting some rest. Amen. Good to see you, Pastor. <laughs> I'm sure he's watching online with the rest of the rest of the congregation on today. Turn to the book of Hebrews. Book of Hebrews. And uh, go to chapter 12, chapter 12 of the book of Hebrews. Chapter 12, the book of Hebrews. But I'm actually going to start reading in chapter 11, which, as uh, many of us may know, is, is commonly referred to as what? The Hall of Faith. The Hall of Faith. So you can turn to 12, but I'm actually going to believe, begin reading in chapter 11 because we need to offer some context for what we're going to be sharing today. And I want to give you some context for that in Jesus' name. Now, Hebrews was actually written around the second half of the first century, so somewhere between 50 and 100 A.D. So within approximately 18 to 68 years after the death and burial of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is when this book was written. And the writer is writing to fellow Hebrews who, like himself, have given up everything to follow Jesus. They've given up everything. And, you know, as we all know, the first who, who came to Christ were actually Hebrews, Jews. Amen? 
And so they were those who were practicing Judaism for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. They had a lineage. They were pointed all the way back to Moses. And they would always retell the story when going into the synagogues. They would retell the story of how their fathers and how their fathers' fathers and how their fathers' fathers. And, and so Judaism was what they were born on. That was what they were grew up on. They were following their Jewish faith. And then comes along Jesus and challenges all that. Challenges all that. And he says, I'm the one that the word was spoken of. I'm the Messiah. He challenges all of that. And because he didn't come as they thought he would come, it was an issue. <laughs> it was an issue. And so the writer understands that they as Hebrews who have studied Judaism for many, many years, he understands that now they're in this place where they've left everything. They've left their history. Many situations, they've left their families. And now they're trying to follow Jesus Christ. And so he understands their position and where they are in this season of their life. And chapter 11 actually begins with a very well-known passage that defines what faith is, right? It says what? Now faith is what? The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things what? Unseen, not seen. And so he begins chapter 11 there, the hall of faith, by sharing with us what the definition of faith is. And then he goes on, and again, he's speaking to his fellow Hebrews who have left everything, including their faith, including their, 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 their uh, religious Jewish heritage. And he tells them, you know, by faith, Abraham did all these great and mighty things. By faith, Isaac did all these great and mighty things. By faith, Jacob and Joseph, they all did these great and mighty works by faith. And then we pick him up now. We're going to actually pick him up in Hebrews 11 and 23 as he gets to Moses in the hall of faith. And he says this, by faith... Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child, and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. He goes on to say, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. <laughs> Somebody say amen. Amen. And then it goes on as you read down through chapter 11, by faith he forsook Egypt. And then he talks about by faith in verse number 29, they passed through the Red Sea. Uh, verse number 30, by faith, the walls of Jericho came down. Verse 31, by faith, the harlot, of, uh, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. Then verse number 32, it says, and what shall I say more? I will run out of time. Our time will fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson, and Japheth, and David, and Samuel, all the others who by faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to the flight of the enemies. Women received their dead, raised to life again by faith, and others were tortured not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trials of cruel mockings and scourging, yea, and moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn under. They were tempted, were slain with sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented of, the wor of this world where they were not worthy. They wandered in the deserts and in mountains and in dens and in caves of earth. And then finally in verse number 39, it says in chapter 11, 
And all these, having received a good report through faith, received not the promise. They walked by faith. They were faithful to God. They received a good report, but they did not receive the promise. Verse number 40, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. <laughs> they walked by faith but did not receive the promise. What promise? The Messiah. The promised one. The one that had been foretold of. Jacob and Abraham and Jeremiah and all those that went before these Hebrews that he is speaking to, they walked by faith, they were faithful to God, but they didn't receive the promise. So these verses set the context for what he's going to say in chapter number 12 as he's talking to his fellow Hebrews who now, having left everything, are following Jesus. Now you got to understand something about these first Christians. When they left Judaism and said we're following Jesus, they were ostracized. They were kicked out. They were abandoned. They were imprisoned. And many of them were martyred. Amen? And a writer is here to inspire them to keep the faith. I know you're going through. I know there's pain and suffering. I know there's torture. I know there's imprisonment. I know you didn't lost your job and can't feed your kids. But I want you to keep the faith. So using the metaphor of a race, the writer sets out to remind them and to inspire them to keep on running <laughs> despite the persecution. Verse number one of chapter number 12, our key focus. Wherefore, seeing we also. Now, I just told you about Samson. I just told you about Jacob. I just told you about Joseph. I just told you about David. I told you about all those folks. But now, wherefore, seeing we also are encompassed with so great a crowd of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us what? Run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who, for the joy, somebody say joy, that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. You haven't resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Somebody say amen for the word. I want to read that one more time again in, in our vernacular today. I want to bring out some points because this is our key portion of scripture for today. Again, I'm going to read it in a message translation if you would allow me. Chapter 12, verse number one, message translation, the book of Hebrews. Do you see what this means? All these pioneers the ones he was talking about in chapter 11, Samson and Joseph and all those folks. All these pioneers who blazed the way. All these veterans cheering us on. It means we better get on with it. Strip down. Start running. And never quit. No extra spiritual fat. No parasitic sins. Keep your eyes on Jesus, who both began and finished, uh, finished, uh, let me see, I'm sorry, guys, finished this race we're in. Study how he did it. 
because he never lost sight of where he was headed. That exhilarating finish in and with God. He could put up with anything along the way. Cross, shame, whatever. When you find yourselves flagging or flagging in your, in your faith, go over the story again. Item by item, the long litany of hostility he plowed through. That will shoot adrenaline in your souls. <laughs> Somebody say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Today, I want to talk to you on the subject, why are you running? Why are you running? Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor, why are you running? Why are you running? Why are you running? Why are you running? I'm probably going to offend some folks today. Probably going to offend some people because I know it's Christmas time. I'm, I'm <laughs> I know it's Christmas time. We, you know, it's supposed to be all about, you know, Jack Frost nipping at your nose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's, it's supposed to be all about, uh, you know, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and Frosty the Snowman and chestnuts roasting on an open fire. It's time to put lights on every inch of the house. Every inch. It's time to buy a tree so big you can barely fit it through the door. So I'm probably going to offend some folks. And how can we forget Santa Claus? Mm -hmm. It's time to shop, shop, shop. Till you drop, drop, drop. So yeah, I may offend some folks today because, you know, even though it's the, it's the jolliest time of the year, I think the church has a problem. And the problem in it is this. According to some of the most popular books and some of the most popular messages and the most popular songs that we hear in Christendom, we are supposed to be living our best life now. Every day is supposed to be Friday now. Mm -hmm. See, for the modern Christian, we're supposed to have bank accounts that overflow. More than enough. And if you get sick, just say the word. In 24 hours, it's supposed to, you're supposed to be good. That's what, that's what you hear a lot in Christian them today. See, my problem is this, is that the mind of the world has seeped into the church. And we too have now gotten a microwave mindset. <laughs> a microwave mindset, like the prodigal son, give it to me now, father. Give it to me now. Give it to me now. Give it to me now. I want it now. We got the microwave mindset that creeps into the church. And many Christians believe that's what Jesus came to do, to give it to you now. Jesus is my personal butler. Give it to me now. He's supposed to give you your best life now. We even abuse scripture to make it say what we want to say. And we listen to the preachers who preach what we want to preach so we can feel good about what they say. Oh. I'm sorry, y'all. My ear is itching. My ear is itching. We ride around in fancy cars with tags that say I'm blessed. As if, 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 as if, you know, having a small car that ain't so fancy means you ain't.
We got more luxury brands in our closet than Kim Kardashian, but we ain't got no money. Merry Christmas. I have a question for you today. Why are you running? I feel this thing in my spirit, y'all. Why are you running? The writer of Hebrews knew that these Christians, these first believers in Christ, gave up everything to follow him. Life was no longer comfortable for them. Mm -hmm. They went from sitting on a couch to sitting in prisons. Mm -hmm. They went from living a life of freedom to being in chains. Mm -hmm. They went from being the ones who were in the Roman Colosseum. You ever seen the Roman Colosseum? The pictures of the Roman Colosseum? So they were, they were the ones who were sitting in the Roman Colosseum, but now they were actually the entertainment in the Roman Colosseum. They went from having three square meals a day to not having enough food to put on the plate. The hiding writer, excuse me, the writer of Hebrews knew there was no way they were going to survive and walk by faith if they were looking at the here and the now. They needed to understand the reason they were in this race. They needed to understand, why am I running for Jesus? Think about this, y'all. Come on now, put yourself there. If you need to close your eyes, close your eyes, but put yourself there. These folks have given up everything. No more comfortable life. No more hanging out with your friends. No more going to the nicest restaurants. No more, no more, no more. Now you are of the ostracized crowd. You're of them folks who follow in that man named Jesus. They were kicked out, kicked down, kicked around. And the writer of Hebrews is trying to inspire them to keep on running this race. Don't leave it now. Do like your forefathers. Walk by faith. So using Jesus as an example in chapter 12, the writer tells them and gives them the reasons they should run and how to run this race. He first tells them, look unto Jesus. <laughs> look unto Jesus. If you are going to run this race that God has set before you, you got to be looking at Jesus. Mm -hmm. See, in most marathons, runners keep their eyes on the course, they keep their eyes out for any obstacles, and they keep their eyes out for the competitors around them. That, that's what you do in a marathon, if you're, if you're running a marathon. Anybody here ever ran the marathon? All right, anybody here ever ran 200 yards? <laughs> okay. So they keep their eye on the course. They're looking at the course. They're looking for any obstacles. And they're watching out for the competition around them. That's what you do when you're in a marathon. But the writer of Hebrews says, in the eternal race, in the race of life, we got to keep our eyes on Jesus. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. I appreciate y'all. I really do. I love y'all, and I'm so glad you love me, but I ain't got my eyes on you. And I sure enough hope you ain't got your eyes on me. Because <laughs> I ain't much to look at. And I sure enough ain't nobody to be following. As Paul said, follow me as I what? I love my mom and dad. I can't, can't ask for no better. You hear me? Harold and Betty, they some special people, but I ain't got my eyes on them. 
Love my pastors. Thank God for Pastor C, Pastor J. But I ain't got my eyes on them. See, the problem is most of us, some of us, are trying to run this race for Jesus while looking at everything else. No wonder we ain't making no progress. Because we got our eyes on the wrong thing. Look at your name and say, neighbor, keep your eyes on Jesus. You know what? Look at him again and say, neighbor, get your eyes off of me. Jesus is the one who's running with me and will never forsake me. Jesus is the one who's running in me and giving me the strength. Jesus is the one who's the author and finisher of my faith. Jesus is the one who tells me to keep my eyes on the race he set before me. Jesus is the one who reminds me that none of the stuff in this present world is my prize. But he alone is my great reward. Hallelujah. Somebody say thank you, Jesus. Too many folk got their eyes on the stuff in this world rather than on Jesus. All that's in the world, the Bible tells us what? All that's in the world is what? The lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Get your eyes on Jesus. Get your eyes on Jesus. If you want to run this race, you got to be focused on him, supremely focused on him. There's no other way to run this race. You can't be looking around at what folks doing. I got too much of my own to be trying to look at your plate. My plate is full. I don't know about yours. My plate is full. I ain't got time to be worrying about what's on your plate. Now, if you ask me for a helping hand, I'll be there to help as much as I can. Because that's what the Lord has called me to do, and that's what I want to do. But I got to run this race. I got to keep my eyes on Jesus. Merry Christmas. What else did the writer tell us? He tells us in this scripture, your ultimate joy and your ultimate rest are still to come. Not now. Not now, microwave Christians. Not now, name it and claim it. Your ultimate joy and ultimate rest are still to come, not now. He goes on to say this, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was what? Set before him. For the joy that was set before him. Endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set at the right hand of the throne of God. Before Jesus could get to his ultimate joy, he had to go through the cross. He had to go through the cross. That's what it's saying there. It says he knew he had a joy that was coming, but first he had to go to the cross. Remember when he was in, what, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, Father, if there's any other way. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Before he could get to the joy that was set before him, he had to go through the cross. And Jesus said, anyone who comes after me, you got to do what? Pick up your cross and what? Follow me. But unfortunately, I believe too many, too many of us are picking up everything the world has to offer. Picking up all the stuff the world has to offer. Now we ain't got no room in our hands for the cross. We 
picking up everything else, elder, in this race. Picking up all the stuff. Give me all the stuff. I want all the stuff. Give me all the stuff. And Jesus is like, can you pick up the cross? Uh, uh, well, I'm going to hold on to this too, you know. If we are going to run this race, we got to let that stuff go and pick up the cross and follow him. Before he got to the joy that was set before him, Jesus had to go through the cross. It's time for us to pick up our cross and follow him. I was talking to a brother the other day. Talking to a brother the other day, and he blessed my soul. He says, you know, Brian, this is what I've been doing lately. He says, Sunday mornings, I've been going out and ministering to folks who are hurting in a certain part of this city. They're on the streets. They're hurting. They're in pain. They're lost. They don't know where to go. They don't know what to do. They're, they're, in, they're in bondage. And I felt compelled to go out there and share God's word with them on Sunday mornings. That's picking up your cross. That's picking up your cross. Before he got to the joy, Jesus had to go through the cross for the joy that was set before him. That's what kept him running because he knew he had joy coming, the ultimate joy. I'm not saying every day got to be in pay for a day full of pain and suffering. I'm not trying to say that. I'm not trying to say we can't enjoy God's blessings in this life. But like I said before, I think so many of us are enjoying so much that we no longer have room in our arms to pick up the cross. Ask your neighbor, neighbor, what's in your arms? What's in your arms? What's in your arms? What's in your arms? Jesus understood that the ultimate joy would not be found here. He knew that. He knew that. As a matter of fact, in Isaiah 53 and 2, it prophesies concerning the sorrows that he would, he would face. It says this, for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and we you shall see him. There is no beauty that you should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men. A man of what? Sorrows and acquainted with what? Grief. And we hid as we were our eyes from him, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely. He hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Jesus faced many sorrows in his race. It wasn't easy. He often cried. He was hurting. But what did he do to keep on running? What did he do not to give up on the race? For the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross. He kept his mind on the ultimate joy that was coming his way. He kept his mind on the ultimate joy that was coming his way. You know, again, the writer is using the, the, the analogy of a race. And, 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 and it made me think about this. Jesus kept his eyes on the prize. He kept his eyes on the joy that was set before him. That's what allowed him to endure the cross. And it made me think about this. You know how it is in a marathon. If you've ever, ever watched one on TV. In a marathon, runners are running. 
They're running. And let's say the finish line, let's say, you know what, as a matter of fact, why don't we do this? Bob and your lovely wife, stand up if you don't mind. Stand up if you don't mind. Y'all going to be the finish line right here. Hold the finish line, okay? Here's the finish line. She got one and you got one. That's the finish line. Now, see, if you've ever watched a race, a marathon race on TV or whatever, the runners are running, right? And every so often, they will get to a water station, you know? A water station. Now, the water station is a place for them to get a break. They get some water, but they keep on running with the water. And they re-drink the water, and they get what? Refreshment. And they're refreshed, and they can keep on running. Amen? And then they run some more, but they're not done yet. Then they run some more, and they may get to another water station. And they enjoy the refreshment. Ah, thank you so much for the refreshment. I appreciate the refreshment. Woo! But they still haven't gotten to the finish line. So what do they do? They keep on running. Keep on running. Keep on running. And they may come, Deacon, to another water break, a place of refreshment, a place where they can be renewed before they get to the finish line. But the problem with many of us in this race called life, we have actually stopped at the refreshment break. We didn't forgot about the joy that is set before us. And see, we didn't got here, and because we didn't got a little bit of refreshment, because we didn't got a little something, we good to go. Hey, I'm good to go. I'm right here. I'm good. I'm good. Yeah, yeah, I'm good. I got my Gucci. I'm good. I got my Mercedes. I'm good. Uh huh. I got my 5,000 square foot house. I'm good. Mm -hmm. I, I got my clothes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm good. I got my shoes. I'm good. I'm good right here. But you ain't even finished the race. <laughs> then it stopped right here at the refreshment break, Mom. Thinking that the refreshment break is the finish line. I'm good to go. Let me tell you what the Bible says. The Bible says, eye has not seen, ear has not heard all that God has in store for them that love him. You have no idea what's at the finish line. You have no idea what's at the finish line. No idea what's at the finish line. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. You have no idea. But you are comfortable with a refreshment break. I went out to dinner a little while back with two friends of mine, a brother in the gospel, sister in the gospel. I hadn't spent too much time together, so we got together, went out to dinner just to catch up, see how life was going. And you know how it is. You sit down at the table and you start talking about life. And I mean, we all got something going on. We all got issues that we're facing. We were talking about life. And I made a comment that I've made maybe to some of y'all. Some of y'all may have heard me make this comment. I made the comment that if Jesus comes right now, I ain't got no problem with it. Maranatha. 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 Come, Lord Jesus. I ain't got a problem with it. And, when, and the sister in the gospel said this. Well, you know what? I don't want him to come right about now. I don't want him to come yet. There's some things I want to do. Some places I want to see. It's so important that you don't want to go home. 
What is so important in this earth, in this place, that you don't want to see Jesus? What is so important that you ain't ready to go home? You want to stay in this sin sick world to go on a vacation? You want to sit, you want to stay in this world where sickness is roaming through the land. Everybody got to wear a mask because you want to get your dream house. Huh, what? And you an evangelist. You know what, Lord, leave her here. Come get me. Come get me. <laughs> Y'all can have it. Y'all can have it. I'm looking for a world. God said, the Lord says, look, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you will be also. You have no idea what God has in store for you. No more sickness. No more pain. No more sin. And you want to stay here. You don't want Jesus to come yet. Is you crazy? Is you crazy? What are you running for? Are you running for the water break? Or are you running to get to the end? Like the old saints used to say, well, I'm going to go on and see what the end is going to be. <laughs> I want to see the end. Hey, God, hallelujah. I want to see the end. I want to see his glory. I want to see his power. I want to see the mansion he's prepared for me. I want to see it. I want a place of peace. I want a place of rest. I don't want this broken all down body. I look in the mirror, I'm like, man, it ain't getting no better. It ain't getting no better. Pushing all these weights, running all this stuff, trying to eat right, it ain't getting no better. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Can't get along with my neighbors. Can't get along with my coworkers. Can't get along in my house. Can't get along with the dog. Can't get along with the cats. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Ain't got enough money to pay my bills. Don't know what I'm going to do for retirement. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Hallelujah. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, what are you running for? Why are we in this race and we don't even want to get to the prize? Don't even want to get to the prize. I'm good enough with a water break. That's all this is. <laughs> Just a water break. You have no idea what Jesus is preparing for you. Ah. Ah. You have no idea. You have no idea. You have no idea. He said, look, if you want to run this race, you got to keep the prize in your eyes. You got to remember that God has gone to prepare, that Jesus has gone to prepare a place for you, that where he is, you will be also. Mm -hmm. And then he says this, yeah, how else should I run this race, writer of Hebrews? Well, he says this, if you're tired and don't feel like you can run on, think about Jesus. Uh -huh. If you're tired and don't think you can run on, Think about Jesus. 
The writer understands we grow weary. He knows that. <laughs> the writer understands he, we grow tired. He, he, he knows that. He understands that there are times where we are tempted to walk out on the race. He, he understands that. But he says, look, if you're going to run this race and there are times that you go tired, there are times that you go weary, there are times that you want to give up, there's times you want to give in, there's times that you want to sit down and say no more. He said, think about Jesus. Think about him. Think about him. Because you have not given up your blood for sin. When you don't want to run no more. When you just want to give in. Ask me how I know. I don't want no more of this. I'm good. I'm going to go off and do my own thing. Go my own way. Hmm, everybody else having fun. I'm going to have some fun too. Huh. Everybody else doing their thing. I'm going to do my thing too. <laughs> Ain't nobody else trying to live right. Why am I trying to stay between the lines? I know the way is narrow and few go thereby. But why I gotta, I mean, Why don't I just go out and do what everybody else is doing? He says, I understand you're going to grow weary. I understand you're going to grow tired. But keep your eyes on Jesus and think on him and what he has done for you. How the pain he went through for you, the suffering he went through for you, the blood he gave up on the cross. So when you grow weary, when you just can't take it no more, when you want to give up on the race, when you want to stop at the water break and say, I'm good. I know folks like that. Folks who are running for God and then said no more. I'm done. I don't believe in God no more. Somewhere along the way, they done lost track. They took their eyes off Jesus. Brothers and sisters, this Christmas, I got a question for you. Why are you running? Why? Why? Why are you getting up on Sunday morning and coming to church? Why? 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 Why are you going to Bible study? Why? Why? Why are you fasting you know, in a few weeks when we fast? Why? Do, why? Why well, give up the food? Why not just eat the chicken? Why? For the joy that is set before me. God has a place for me. That I have no idea. And you want me to give that up for you. I don't think so. <laughs> you will lose some friends on this side. But that's all right. Because <laughs> I got a friend in Jesus like no other. <laughs> Why are you running? Why are you serving in the church, on this committee, that committee, on this board, on that board? Why are we running? Hmm. I don't know about you, but I'm running because I want to see the end. The joy that God has set before me, I'm running because I want to be in his presence. He is my great reward. He is my great reward. He is my, if I never get a Mercedes, he is my great reward. If I never hang out with the rich and famous, he is my great reward. If I never get to go into Macy's and buy everything out, he is my great reward. He's my great reward. 
Y'all can have it all. Enjoy it. Have a good time. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Amen. Somebody stand up and give God a hand praise in the house. Why are you running? Why are you running? Why are you running? Come on, magnify him with me. Hallelujah. We bless you, God. We bless you. We bless you. I'm running because I want to see your face. I'm running because I want to be in your presence. I'm running because I want to see your glory. I'm running because I want to live in the mansion that you have prepared for me. I'm running because you've been good to me. Better than I've been to myself. I'm running because your love for me. Your love for me is like no other. How can I say no to that kind of love? How can I say no to that kind of love? How can I say no to that kind of love? The kind of love that would take off his robe in glory. Wrap himself in this stinking flesh. Be born in a manger. Next to goats. All kind of livestock around him. Give up those things to come here and then within a few short years give his life for me how can I say no to that kind of love but not only that he said son I'm leaving here I am but don't worry I'm going to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you can be also. And I'm telling you now, you have seen nothing like it. Don't stop at the water break and be satisfied. I'm glad you got a nice house. I'm glad you got a nice car. I'm glad you got a good job. Those are all wonderful things. I'm glad you can go to Macy's later on and get a bunch of presents, nice things. But don't be satisfied with the water break. Keep running after Jesus. Keep running after Jesus. Keep running after Jesus. I know the days get weary. I know they get hard. I know it's tough. I know you want things to be a little bit easier. But God said, I've got something for you. And it's a joy that you can't even imagine. Don't give up on the water break. Don't sit down. Keep running for him. Keep running for him. Keep running for him. Keep running for him. Now is not the time to stop. Now is not the time to look back. Now is not the time. We press forward to the mark of the high calling, which is in Christ Jesus. <laughs>